this Wednesday is the most sacred day um, in Jewish culture. Um, it's Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, as it's known uh, in the Bible. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning. Uh, last week was a festival that's called uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's the beginning of, of the new year. Uh, in the Bible, though, it's called the Day of Trumpets. These, these uh, festivals such as Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, they're still celebrated today, but they're a little bit different than they were um, in the Bible. As we go along, especially with uh, the Day of Atonement, you'll, you'll see why. But we're going to focus, we're not so much focusing on the traditions that are done today, um, though there are some carryover uh, traditions. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Day of Atonement and the way it's described in the Bible, particularly in Leviticus uh, chapter 16. So on Rosh Hashanah, uh, the Day of Trumpets, it, it started with a, a blast of, of trumpets, and it led up, uh, there was 10 days between uh, that day and the Day of uh, Atonement. And during that time, it was a time for Israel to fast, to self-reflect, it was a time of, of repentance, and then it would lead up to the Day of Atonement when the high priest uh, would make atonement for the sin of the nation of Israel on their behalf. If we're going to understand the Day of Atonement, we've got to first start with understanding what atonement means. Atonement is the covering of, of sin and the reconciliation of, of two Parties. So it's dealing with uh, someone's sin and the reconciliation of, of two parties. In particular, as it pertains to the Day of Atonement, that's uh, the nation of Israel and, and God, right? But atonement, uh, occasionally you'll hear atonement between two people. I made atonement, you know, because I wronged uh, somebody. It's, it's to correct a wrongdoing, and actually, literally, the word atonement is, is to be one uh, with with one another, with one another, so it's to cover a sin and to to be uh, reconciled. Uh, Michael Heiser says that the Day of Atonement it helps us to think of it in this terms: it's it's a great big reset button. It's a once a year reset button in the nation. Uh, of Israel so that they could atone for their sins, that they could cleanse the temple and uh, carry on for an, another year in their relationship with, uh, with the Lord. All of this is centered around uh, the, uh, the temple. The temple is everything uh, was everything, rather, for the nation of Israel during biblical times. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, it all cent centered around the temple and its sacrifices. The temple was the meeting place where man met with, with God. It was where the sacrifices and all the offerings were made uh, through the priests, the Levitical priesthood and the high priests. All of that was centered around this whole temple system. So it's important that we understand this temple system. Even just a, a, a basic cursory understanding can, um, when you read the New Testament, it can open a door to just see how glorious the gospel is and the fulfillment of things that Jesus Christ uh, fulfilled uh, in his first coming and as well as his second. So let's, let's, let's try and break this down into layman's terms. There's three sections, basic sections to the temple. There is the outer court. And if you see in this picture, there's that big bowl of water. There's some smaller bowls of water. That big bowl of water is called the sea. That's where uh, ritual washings would happen and cleansing. The priests had to cleanse themselves before doing work in the temple, especially on the Day of Atonement. That big altar uh, there with the fire coming out of it, that's the brazen altar. That's where the sacrifices uh, were made to God. So you've got that outer court there, but then you've got the, the inner sanctuary. And that's when you actually walk inside the temple, that big room there. Um, only the priesthood was allowed in that room. Nobody else in Israel was allowed inside the temple. They would hang out on the outside of the temple. They were not allowed on the inside of the temple. You had things like the lampstands that represented uh, the light of uh, the Lord and the light of, of Israel. You had the table of showbread was God's provision. There's 12 stacks of, of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. You had the altar of incense that was in there that represented the prayers of, of the people of Israel, of God's people, is that prayer went up before his, 
his altar. So that's the most holy place. And that was taken care of by the priesthood. They were the only ones allowed in there. And then in the back section, in the smaller room, was the most holy place or the holy of, of holies. And only the high priest was allowed in the holy of holies. And he could only go in there once a year. You know what that time was? It's the day of atonement. <laughs> It would be this Wednesday if the temple was still uh, standing that the high priest would enter into that room. So only the high priest was allowed in there and he was only allowed in there uh, once a year. That represented, that room represented the throne room of, of God. Revel, in uh, Revelation chapter four, John, uh, the apostle, he literally got to uh, be in the presence of God in his literal throne room um, in heaven. This is a representation of that throne room. The reality is in heaven, and this is a representation uh, of that place. Inside was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, if you've ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's that golden um, uh, rectangular uh, box um, that resided in the most holy place. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. Uh, there was a jar of, of manna. God had fed uh, Israel. He had provided for them in the wilderness and their 40 years in the wilderness with manna from, from heaven so that they would always have food. And Aaron's uh, budding staff, the high priest, the first high priest, his staff, uh, God had uh, worked a miracle and literally made it blossom with flowers and, and almonds, literally came out of this staff. He brought life out of something uh, that was uh, represented um, death or the absence of, of life. And so all those things were placed inside this Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. Uh, this mercy seat, if, if, if the Holy of Holies is uh, the throne room of God, the mercy seat is his throne. And so there was two golden cherubim and they had their wings spread out and they made a seat for the Lord. In fact, on the day of atonement, it says in Leviticus 16, that God would actually appear within the cloud of smoke that would be uh, brought about by the incense and he would actually be on the mercy seat. That was his throne room. So that was like the meeting place. If you see heaven meets earth, right? It also was decorated like the garden of Eden because in Eden, heaven and earth came together, right? And, and God was with man. Well, in the holy of holies, now sin has happened, right? That's the reason only the high priest could go in there and on the right conditions could he go in there into this most holy, sacred place that presence of God, where the presence of God existed. Only he could go in there because that's where heaven touched down to earth. That's where God came and met with his people was in that most holy place. And particularly on top of the Ark of the Covenant, on that mercy seat was the throne of God. So what happens on the day of atonement? Now that we know a little bit about the temple system, what happens on this particular day? There is a detailed description in Leviticus 16. In fact, the book of Leviticus, remember I said this is the most sacred day uh, in all of Judaism. Uh, the, the book of Leviticus is structured around the Day of Atonement. It's on chapter 16. It's right in the middle of the book. And uh, there's, there's this um, literary form called a chiastic arch. And Leviticus is one big chiastic arch. All the things described in the first half of the book lead up to the Day of Atonement. And then you have all those things described again on the latter half of the book. And a chiastic arch was always to point to that central place, and that would be where you would want to draw your attention and focus on. And so uh, just a side note, the Day of Atonement is the, the chiastic arch, the arch of the book of, of Leviticus. So on this day, the high priest, he first had to uh, prepare himself if he was going to make atonement for the nation of Israel. And so he would get in those big uh, those water containers, um, and he would bathe himself. And then he would actually change out of his priestly garments, and he would uh, uh, change into all white linens, which represented being, being pure, made, being made pure, this ritual cleansing, and then putting on the white robes. Now he was ready to enter into the Holy of Holies. And so what he would do is he would take a bull 
that was for his own sins, and so he would have to sacrifice this bull for his own sins because he had sin as well, right? It wasn't just Israel. The high priest also had sin, and so he had to deal with his own sin. So he sacrificed the bull, and then he also had a ram for what's called a burnt offering. It's like an offering of, of devotion uh, to God. So he would make the sin offering and this devotional offering that he would make uh, for himself. And he would enter into the Holy of Holies with the blood of this bull, and he would sprinkle the uh, mercy seat there on the throne of, uh, of God. And then he would take two goats for the nation of Israel, okay? Two goats, and he would cast lots over these goats. Basically, like kind of drawing straws or throwing uh, dice to choose which goat is going to be used for which situation. So one of these goats was going to be for God, and one of these goats was going to be for Azazel, Now, if you're looking, when you go back, and I do recommend you go back and read uh, Leviticus 16, I think it's going to be really cool after you listen to the sermon and then you go back and read it, because before it had been like, oh, okay. But now when you go back and read it, it's going to be, oh, sweet. And then when you go and read the book of Hebrews, there's a couple chapters I'm going to point out later, it's going to blow your mind. (laughs) So, Azazel is it's 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 a lot of people translate it scapegoat so some of your translations will say scapegoat translations like the ESV actually left it as a zell because that's the actual word why did they do that because as a zell in Jewish tradition is also a demon and so the idea is not that an animal would be sacrificed to a demon, but as we'll see, this, this particular goat is going to carry the sins of the nation. They're going to carry him away. And so the idea is that it's going to where it belongs, right? If you think of a demon, you think of that's evil, we're going to carry the sin away to the place that it belongs. Out there in the wilderness where evil is, we're going to put it in its place, put sin in its place. So, goes like this. One goat would be sacrificed for sin. That would be the offering to God. And the other was carried away to the place of Azazel. And so the, the high priest would take the blood of the, he took the blood of the bull. He sprinkled the mercy seat. He would also take the blood that was of the, the goat that was sacrificed for Israel's behalf. And he would take it in there into that throne room in the Holy of Holies. And he would sprinkle the mercy seat. Now, what's he doing there? He not only sprinkled the mercy seat, but he he also sprinkled the altar. He sprinkled different areas of the temple. He's cleansing the temple. He's He's actually making atonement for the temple. He's like, what do you mean? I thought you said atonement was the covering of sin, the temple sin somehow? Like, no, the people sin and they've tainted the temple, right? And so it's a cleansing. And in the Jewish mindset, blood cleanses. You see that in Christ? Blood cleanses, and so they're taking the blood of these goats that were sacrificed, and they're cleansing the temple of the sin from the sin of the people, so it can be a holy place for another year to God. It's all symbolism. The other goat, right, the the, the scapegoat or the goat to Azazel, was brought to the high priest, and we'll pick up in verse twenty-one, of Leviticus sixteen. And so Aaron shall lay, and and what he means by Aaron is the high priest. Aaron was the very first high priest, so whoever was in his lineage, that would be the Aaron, that would be the new high priest. So Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. So he'd say a prayer, he'd confess their sins, the sins of the nation, and he, he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. So there was a man who was appointed to actually lead this goat out. And the goat shall bear all the iniquities uh, on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness." Actually, I think Israel, the, the Jews were a little bit uh, disobedient <laughs> uh, according to uh, tradition. They, a lot of times when they would lead this goat out and the guy would lead the goat out, they were afraid that if they let the goat free, somehow it might wander back into the camp. So Peter would have hated this. They actually would kick the goat off of a cliff um, to make sure it never... It, it never returned. I'm not trying to laugh. It's because you guys are laughing that I'm laughing. Right. So 
They wanted to make sure that this, if this, if this goat was carrying away their sins, that it didn't make its way back into to the camp. So they p- kicked the poor goat uh, down the cliff to make sure he never, he never returned. And so Leviticus 16 ends, verse 30, for on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you, and you shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. You see the reset button? You see, you see what's going on here? The temple is the meeting place of God. That's where everything's centered around in Israel, right? And there's this big reset button. Their sins had to be atoned for every year. Reset. That's what, a, that's what the day of atonement. So if you think of it in that terms, you'll never forget what, what uh, the day of atonement is about. It's the great reset. What does all this mean? This is super cool. Jesus fulfills it all. Uh, in, in, in later messages, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through 25 reasons, not in one message, but I'm going to go through 25 reasons that uh, I trust Jesus as my uh, Lord and Savior. And this is one of them. This is one of them. Jesus fulfills it all. Check this out. Hebrews, Hebrews 9. I don't have it up on the... On the um, on the screen there, but Hebrews 9, if, they, if you just want to jot down, it, for the, those of you who are note takers, write down for later uh, Hebrews 9 if you're not following along. Hebrews 9, starting in verse 6, these preparations having thus been made, it's talk, he's talking about the day of atonement, okay? These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. Remember, they could go into the inner sanctuary, but into the second, only the high priest goes, really in the Holy of Holies, right? And he, but once a year, he could only go once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Just a little side note, what do you mean by unintentional? Well, during the year, they would confess their sins, right? And there were sacrifices that were made and stuff like that. So they had a relationship with God. But what about those sins that we all just forget about, right? And so the great reset is making sure all that stuff is taken care of, those things, those sins that we're not aware of, right? And are those sins we commit maybe in ignorance or we've forgotten about, and so that's uh, had never been confessed, and so that's what that means. And then skipping down in Hebrews 9 to verses 24 through 28, for Jesus Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands. Remember, the, the temple was, was a representation, which are copies of the true things, but Jesus actually entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood that isn't his own. For then he would have to, Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the year. So it's not a once a year reset is what he's saying. With Jesus is not a once a year reset. He don't have to be crucified every year. But as it is, He has appeared, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he's the high priest and he's the sacrifice. And just as it is appointed uh, a man wants to die and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly await for him. So if you think Christianity is a made up religion, you tell me how they worked all that out. And that is just like one element of fulfillment that Jesus fulfilled in the Old Testament. So this Old Testament was around for thousands of years before Jesus. And then this man comes and he fulfills his whole uh, sacrificial system, which nobody saw coming. These guys, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews and, and Paul and Peter and all these guys who wrote these, they would have to be literal geniuses to come up with this stuff. So we know Jesus fulfills it. The book of Hebrews points that out, how Jesus fulfilled this day of atonement, and he is that ultimate once and for all reset. But just how does that work? How does he do that? How does his death and resurrection, how does it atone for our sins? And there have been theories throughout the ages. 
meaning from the time of Christ up until uh, now. And here's a few of those, of those theories. First, the first and earliest uh, theory was the moral influence theory. And it goes like this. Um, Jesus dies to bring a positive change in humanity. He, he dies to, to reform uh, the human uh, race and the Holy Spirit comes to help Christians live the life of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So Jesus dies so that we can be changed. The Bible talks about us having a heart change, right? And we receive the Holy Spirit. That's part of the new covenant so that we can begin to live the, the life of Jesus Christ. That's the moral influence theory. And another early theory was also the ransom uh, theory. And this early belief was actually held often in conjunction with the moral theory. So it wasn't opposed to the moral influence theory. It was held in conjunction uh, with it. And so it goes like this, Adam and Eve had sold humanity over to the devil at the fall. When they first sinned in the garden, um, they had um, become slaves of sin and death and become slaves of the devil. And so justice required that God pay the devil a ransom. The devil didn't realize Jesus couldn't be held by death. He thought when he died, he was going to die for good. So God, through the resurrection, was able to free us from Satan's grip. The controversy that arose out of this theory was the idea of paying off the devil. But then there's others who still defend this theory, say, ah, it doesn't work like that. It's not that the devil is literally paid off, but this ransom frees us from bondage to sin and death, which Satan used that as a means to control us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, right? And so the devil is able to manipulate us and keep us in sin and bondage uh, to sin and death. And so it wasn't literally that he, he, uh, he had us and God bought us back, but that he was able to manipulate us through sin and death. But when Jesus defeated sin and death, he was able to win us back. And so you have the crisis victor uh, model. This model has been, in, in church history, uh, probably the most prominent um, model of all of these models. In fact, it was the dominant view up until the 12th century. <clears throat> Jesus dies in order to defeat the powers of evil, sin, death, and the devil. And this frees mankind from bondage. This sounds a lot like the whole ransom uh, theory. But the difference is, is they would say, the focus here isn't about anybody being paid off, but just the defeat of evil through Jesus' death and, and resurrection. And so I said that was the dominant up until the 12th century when the satisfaction theory uh, came about. And uh, this idea is that Jesus pays for the injustice of sin and satisfies the justice of, of God. Um, this theory was a reaction to the idea of, of God paying off the devil. Uh, and so they would say it's humanity that owes a debt to God, not God to, to Satan. And so... Jesus, he was fully God, but also is fully human. He pays back God with his death on the cross. During the time of the Reformation, there came about what's called the penal substitutionary um, uh, theory. This is actually a, a very dominant view today with uh, not only the Reformed, but many evangelicals. Um, but it's de developed during the Reformation. It's a modification of the uh, satisfaction theory. You're going to see, you'll see a common theme here is like one's a modification of, of another, right? It's attempts to correct earlier, earlier models. And um, it's so Jesus, it, this has more of a legal uh, framework. Jesus dies to satisfy God's wrath against human sin. And so where penal substitution comes from is Jesus is punished, that's penal, in the place of sinners, that's substitution. So he was punished in our place. We deserve the punishment for sin, and so Jesus took our punishment in our place. And so now God can forgive us because Jesus puni was punished as a substitute. The governmental theory said, oh, well, that's not exactly right. <laughs> and so they, uh, they said he, he took a punishment, but not the exact punishment that we deserved. You know, they, Jesus like didn't go suffer in, in, in hell. He, he died on the cross, right? He was crucified and his death demonstrates God's displeasure towards sin. And so the cross wasn't a payment, but it is a substitute. 
It shows, it was God showing us that the wages of sin is death. And also Jesus, he died for, for the church, not the church building, but he died for his, his people, this entity called the church, which when we become a part of through faith in him, we are saved from God's wrath. And so the idea here is that God's wrath is still on the world, but inside the church, it's like a safe haven where we're, we're, we're freed from that. We're children of God and we're not under the wrath of God. And um, like penal substitution and the satisfaction theory, God can't forgive without Jesus' death. And then finally, very modern um, uh, theory, uh, not, very, not very prominent, uh, but it is pretty recent, is what's called the scapegoat theory. It's based off of the, the idea of the scapegoat that we talked about earlier. Um, Jesus dies as a scapegoat for humanity, and there's no payment to God or Satan, uh, Jesus is not a payment, but he's a victim. The violent crowd kills Jesus, believing he is guilty, but Jesus is proven innocent by God as the true Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. And the crowd is therefore deemed guilty. But good news is, is that Jesus had substituted himself as the victim of our sacrifices. All those sacrifices made it in the temple, they didn't know it, but Jesus was the sacrifice that was made to God. The controversy with this one is that many would say Jesus is not a victim, but a victor. Okay, we're done with the different theories throughout history. Where am I at? Well, I believe that Jesus does open the door to a new life. That's the moral uh, uh, perspective. Uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when we receive Jesus, we're made new creations. We receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, he's definitely there to reform uh, society and make us new. Um, I don't believe Jesus paid Satan as an equal. I definitely don't believe that. Um, but I do believe that he bought us out of sin, or, uh, sin and, and, and death. We were slaves to sin and death, and he bought us out of that, uh, which you, Satan did use to manipulate and condemn us. Um, and this is victory, like the Christus victory um, uh, model. I probably, out of all of them, I th there's elements, as you can see, <laughs> that I take from all of these theories. Um, uh, the crisis victory, uh, crisis victor model is probably the most solid, in my opinion. Um, but I think there's elements in, in a lot of these uh, views. I also believe that Satan was duped at the cross through the resurrection. That's just the personal, the, the way I see scripture. I, I don't think Satan realized that Jesus could be raised from the dead. Yeah, they would have been like partners, right? They weren't partners. When he tells, when he tells uh, the devil or he tells Judas, hey, go and do what you got to do, Satan actually thinks he's getting away with something. It's, it's, it's not like he's like, oh, we're in this together and we're partners, right? Satan had no idea what was, what was coming. He thought he could defeat him in the cross. I, uh, I have come to believe, I do not believe, I do believe Jesus is our substitute, but I do not believe that God poured his wrath on Jesus. God's wrath is a real thing, and it is against sin, right? That's the reason that there's a judgment. But I do not believe that God poured his wrath upon Jesus. I don't believe that's what the cross was about. You say, well, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt forsaken, right? But also, if you read Psalm 22, there's good news at the end of Psalm 22, Okay, that's what Jesus is pointing us to, is the good news that comes out of Psalm uh, 22, that Jesus and that God indeed had not forsaken him, that there's still more to come, and that was his resurrection. Um, I do believe that though Jesus was a sacrifice for all, God's wrath is still being stored up against those who resist him, and I do believe that the church is a safe haven, not this local church called the haven, but the church itself is a safe haven, um, as children of God, we're brought back into relationship with God. I do believe that Jesus was innocent and God uh, proved it through the resurrection. I don't necessarily see him as a victim, though. He, uh, he laid down his own life and he took it up again. So here's the thing. These theories, they, they're human attempts. Y'all have heard me say this with other things that we've gone over, right? They're human attempts. It's not a reason to condemn them or look down on them. These are Christians. These are believers trying to figure it out, right? And put some of these pieces uh, together. And so they're human attempts to improve on one another. 
Because the, the atonement, it is, we know what happens, but there's, there's an element of, of, of mystery, right, to how God does it all through the sacrifice of his son and his resurrection. And so, in my opinions, some ways they improved upon one another, and some ways they didn't. Some, some ways they got worse, right? And so, um, there's, there's that. But um, uh, I think it's very uh, interesting to study, and... Uh, um, yeah, so I ask, what do you see when you see um, the uh, atonement? Um, and thankfully, we are not saved by theories. That's where the sigh of relief always comes. We're not saved by theories. We're saved by Jesus. He died for sin to reconcile us back to God. Remember I said that's what atonement means, right? The covering of sin, right? And the reconciliation of two parties. Jesus died to not only cover our sin, but do away with our sin, right? And bring us back into relationship with God. Jesus fulfills the day of atonement. That's all you need to know. If you hold to one of these theories, that's fine. Don't let anybody call you a heretic. If you differ in one of the theories than the other people, just ignore those people. Don't listen to them, okay? What you need to know is that Jesus died for our sins and he reconciles us back to God. The Great Reset. In 70 AD, the temple was totally destroyed. That was almost 2,000 years ago. The temple was destroyed. And so Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, can no longer be followed how God commanded. Again, this Wednesday, you'll see, you can go on social media, you can go on the news, you can Google it or, or whatever. And there's all kinds of cool uh, traditions that they do uh, over there in Israel. But the, the fact is, the reality is, is they cannot celebrate it the way it was, it was laid out in the Bible, in Leviticus 16. They can't do it. Why? because there's no temple. There hasn't been a temple since 70 AD. So God honest truth, either A, the Jews are acting in disobedience and not resetting once a year because they were called to reset once a year, or the truth is, is that something greater is here and that something greater is Jesus. Jesus is the great reset. And we'll close with this. Here's what the great reset means for us. Hebrews chapter 10, I do have it up. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. Remember I said, remember Hebrews, jot down Hebrews 9, jot down Hebrews uh, chapter 10 to read later. Starting in verse 19, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. Did you know that when Jesus died, that curtain, it tore in two? What does that mean? Remember we said, what do we, what do we say that Holy of Holies was? What was that? What did that represent? What's that? Well, the curtain did, but inside, that's the dwelling place of God. That's his throne room, right? That's the place that only the high priest could go into but once a year. But when Jesus died, right, and his blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, the curtain is torn in two, and we have direct access into the throne room of God. Such good news. So the author of Hebrews here is saying, be confident. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence, confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened us, for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh that was sacrificed, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, he is our great priest, he is our sacrifice, and we can be confident. That's the exhortation here in Hebrews. Be confident. Be confident. You have direct access into the throne room of God by faith in Jesus. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, be assured. You know, faith and hope is not I hope so, it's I know so. Full assurance of faith, that's the command, with our hearts sprinkled clean. Isn't this amazing? The temple was cleansed, right? By the blood of, of, of these bulls and goats, right? That's what he did. Remember, he went through the temple. The temple in the New Testament, who's the temple? The church. The church. And we've been cleansed. We're that safe haven. We've been cleansed. That's what he's saying here. Let us draw near with a true heart and 
uh, full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean, that sprinkling of the blood from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Remember he washed himself and changed into white robes. That's what's happened to us through Jesus. So he says, we can have a heart full of assurance and, and we've been sprinkled clean and we've been washed and we've been made pure. And so God has given us a new heart. And so we should be confident and we need to walk in that. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So in other words, God is faithful. So let us walk in faithfulness. God is faithful. We know that he comes through on what he promises and we know that he's going to come through. He came the first time, right? To fulfill this day of atonement and the Passover and a million other things from the Old Testament. And now he's going to come again and we can, we can bank on it, right? <laughs> that he's gonna fulfill his promises and he's gonna return uh, for us. And so that we can be faithful when times are down. You know, I've had a hard week, right? But I can, be, I can be faithful and I can trust him and I can look to Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. And I can keep running the race even when I'm down. I can keep moving forward and I can keep my eyes on the prize. I can keep my eyes on Jesus. Be faithful for God is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Uh, we've been set free from bondage. Y'all have heard me say, we're not, we're, not set, we're not saved from, just saved from something. We are saved to something. We're saved to a purpose, right? We were redeemed and made whole for a purpose that God has given each and every one of us. And it's all the same. You each have your individual, you know, plans and purposes, maybe jobs, vocations, wherever God has placed you. But don't, don't, don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. Love God, love people, and spread the goodness of Jesus Christ and his gospel everywhere that you go, in your places of work, in your places of play, in your communities, right? With your friends, with your neighbors. Live the life of, of Jesus Christ. And so stir one another up. We're the church, right? We're here to stir one another up to love and to good works because we know that God has set us free and he's given us a, a purpose. And then it says in verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Pastors love that verse. <laughs> Come to church, be a part of the church. We're made for the church. We're the community, right? And the church isn't the meeting together. The church is us as the church. But he says right here, come together, worship together. Let's do this corporately. Let's do this together. No man is an island, right? In our country, it's all about individual salvation. Jesus asked me into my heart and stuff like that. But in the Bible times, it was all about community. It was us as a whole, right? We are the church, right? When we're the temple, yeah, there's a few places where it talks about us individually as the temple, but really it's talking about the church. We are the temple. We're the building blocks of that temple individually. Encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is that? It's final salvation. And we were saved. We're being saved. And then we're going to be saved, right? So if people say, are you saved? Say, yes, I'm saved, but I'm being saved. And then I'm waiting Jesus to come and, and say, save. Uh, salvation means deliverance. That's what it means, right? And he's going to deliver us when he comes uh, a second time for his church. So church, let us take courage. These types of things, I know, I know some of it, it's, it's heavy and stuff, but this stuff is so encouraging for me because when things aren't going, you know, Luke talked about this morning, when things aren't going my way, right, the way that I want it, and I've been praying, right, and I've been fasting, I've been seeking God, and things aren't going my way, and it's like, God, where are you? You're not answering. I guess God doesn't answer prayer. What's going on here? Why am I being left here? I look at things like this. Oh, my goodness, and you can't ignore it. God is real. The gospel is real. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled all of this stuff, right? And so I look to that, and it, and it, it gives a, a solid place for my feet to be grounded, right? And so when the world's crumbling around me, I can keep my, and I can say, no matter, you know, though he slay me, I will still trust you because I know you stand true, and I know you're faithful, and I may not understand what's going on right now, but because you did this, right, and you did this for me and you did this for the church, you're going to continue to be faithful. Amen? So let's 
take heart in things like this, when we see those promises and we see those fulfillments in the Bible, let's stand on those promises and let's remember them. Jot them down. Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the great reset button. He is Leviticus chapter 16. Jesus fulfills it all. And then when you're down, you remember that and say, God is faithful and true no matter what my circumstances are. That's the God that I serve. And let's encourage one another. I told you on signal, you know, Renee came up to me last night, gave me a big old hug, just what I needed, told me she loves me and it touched me. And just reminded me that Jesus is my rest. And we need each other. And I need you guys. It's not just you guys needing the pastor. <laughs> I need you. Luke needs you. We need each other. That's why we come together. That's why we don't n- neglect the, the assembling one, you know, together, coming together. We need each other. We are the church. We're in this together. <laughs> and we motivate each other. And we push each other. And we say, keep running. Don't give up. Keep going in faith. Because he's coming again. And he's coming for us. All the more as we see the day approaching, never give up. And y'all don't let me give up. Love you, church.